Good evening and welcome to Northern Kentucky History Hour. We're going to let everyone in and then we will get started in just a moment or two. Good evening and welcome to Northern Kentucky History Hour. Thank you so much for joining us. We're just letting everyone in and then we will get started. Great. Well, good evening to you all and welcome to the 16th episode of Northern Kentucky History Hour. We're so glad that we that you have joined us tonight. Uh, we look forward to a really great presentation this evening. But before we get started, I do have a couple of housekeeping items. My name is Tara Johnson Nome, and I will be your host this evening. I am a board of trustees member uh, with Behringer Crawford Museum. Uh, Behringer Crawford obviously being the sponsor of this uh, ongoing project, the History Hour. If you have missed any of the past History Hour events, you can find them on Behringer Crawford's Facebook page and on YouTube. So we definitely encourage you to check those out. We've had a number of excellent authors, archeologists, um, historians of all kinds, and really have been fortunate to be able to hear more about the rich history of Northern Kentucky in these last few months. Um, a few other things we will be, um, I noticed most of you are muted and um, you can turn your video off if you prefer, it's, it's really up to you. Um, but we don't want you to just sit back and not interact with us. We, even if you're muted, we want you to participate. So. Uh, find the chat box uh, in your app or online, and you can send in your questions, uh, any comments that you might have, and um, I'll be watching those throughout the presentation, putting them into a list, and then I'll be asking um, your questions to our presenters at the end uh, end of the uh, of their presentation. So, please let us know what you think and what you'd like to know more about. Let's see. Um, I want to thank all of our supporters uh, from the museum. The Behringer Crawford Museum is supported in part by the city of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, the Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, and the Carol Ann and Ralph V. Hale Jr. U.S. Bank Foundation. And of course, our members. If you're not already a member of Behringer Crawford Museum, we could really use your support, especially in these times. We have some really exciting things coming up and we would love for you to be a part of it. So you can go to bcmuseum.org and find out more. And let's see, we have, um, well, sorry, um, we have tonight, um, staff members, really leaders of the museum as our guests. And so I am so pleased to be joined by Lori Risch, Executive Director of Behringer Crawford Museum. Lori's often a viewer, but she is leading behind the scenes every step of the way with this project. And I'm so uh, thankful for her support and guidance. And uh, we also have Kim Garing Cook, who is our Education Director. I wanna tell you all a little bit about both of them before they get started. Lori Risch has been with the Behringer Crawford Museum staff since 1986. She started as education director and has been executive director since 1993. Under her leadership, um, among the capital campaign and many other exciting projects, Fresh Art was initiated. You're gonna hear a little bit about that later in the program. Uh, it created a revenue stream for the museum's youth programming and just a wonderful event for everyone to attend on an annual basis. She's a lifelong Kentucky res resident and she started building the museum's art collection that you're going to hear about tonight. She currently lives in California, Kentucky. So Lori, thank you so much for being with us. Wow. And we also, like I said, have Kim Gehring Cook as one of our presenters tonight. She is the current education director. <laughs> She leads all of our youth and adult programming for Behringer Crawford Museum. She's been with the museum for five years, but she is a veteran educator. She was with Covington Latin School for 18 years as the art and the reading teacher. 
and I hear that she enjoys working with students now without having to grade them. So Kim, thank you for joining us as well. And um, I'm gonna let you all dive right in and get started. So Lori, Kim, welcome. Great, well, thanks for having us. We're happy to be a part of this. Um, we're gonna share our screen here in just a second. Is it sharing? Is it sharing, <laughs> Tara? It, it's not yet, but it, it's sharing from, it should be sharing from any, either screen. So you just click the green button. Click the green button. Green button. It says share screen. We're trying to, we're trying to social distance here. So we're <laughs> two computers. <laughs> And uh, we happen to be located in our um, special exhibit gallery, which um, is hosting at the moment our student invitational art show, the Connie O'Donnell Memorial Art Show, as part of our Fresh Art event. So we at Behringer Crawford, um, there's no way that you can tell history without including all different types of uh, manners and ways to do that. And one way is definitely um, through art. So we're going to talk tonight about how artists, if, if history is nothing but items or documents and the recording of activities and events that have happened in our times. And artists do the same thing. So they are able to be that storyteller. They're able to be able to capture that moment of time, whether it is on a painting, whether it's in pottery, whether it's in photograph, whether it's in drawings, whatever it is. It can be three-dimensional, two-dimensional, but art is an extremely important part of telling history. And so that's why Behringer Crawford has always had an art uh, element within our mission. So we're gonna get ready to kick off here with Kim and start with some of the artists that we hold in the museum's collections. All right, um, so we're gonna talk about artist as storyteller how it intersects with history. And one of the first artists that we like to talk about is Mary Bruce Sharon. Mary Bruce Sharon, um, her his artwork is known as primitive. Think of Covington's own Grandma Moses. Um, primitive style is defined as being childlike in nature. And um, it's also called naive art. So it's very simple in technique. Um, her work is kind of like a child's eye view of Covington because when she lived here, um, it was when she was a young girl, um, very young, living pretty much in her grandfather's house. And later in life, when she started painting around the age of 70, she was painting her memories of when she was a child. So we're getting this glimpse of history from her childhood around the time of the Civil War, so the mid 1800s, um, what it was like living in a pretty wealthy family in Covington. And then, um, but it's also being filtered through her memories as um, a woman in her 70s during the paintings. Um, the picture that you see here is Grandma's Black Table. And it almost reminds me of a Matisse type piece or a Saison where you're looking down at the table and you can see everything laid out because she wants to tell a story of everything that was important that was on there, the photographs, flowers, and everything that she remembers um, that her grandma would have out in the room. And you can also pick up on the fashions of the time with the, the striped wallpaper, the design in the carpet, all of that is recorded. So we get a look at history in a lot of different ways. On this slide here, um, we get um, a picture of the Roebling Suspension Bridge, and I'll get to that in a minute. She was actually born in 1878, and I did mention that sometimes it was like post-Civil War, but her, uh, her mother used to tell her story, so sometimes those memories of her mother's youth are also found in her artwork. Um, so she did live with her mother and her grandfather in Covington, um, because her father died when she was very little. Um, so this is why, even though she wasn't born in Kentucky, um, she was actually born in Missouri, um, she does have that Covington tie. 
Now her grandfather was a pretty important guy in Covington, um, Colonel Henry Bruce. He was the president and one of the chief stockholders in the Cincinnati Covington Bridge Company, along with Amos Schinkel. So he was very, very wealthy and very important. In fact, he was the one who brought Roebling to Covington and Cincinnati to build the bridge. And he actually lived with, with um, Colonel Bruce in his home for about six months. And that was one reason why it was referred to as Grandpa's Bridge. Um, there's also a little story that goes along with that, that his daughter, that Colonel Bruce's daughters, so Mary, Sharon, Mary Bruce Sharon's mother and, and aunt, went to school in Cincinnati and they used to have to um, boat across the Ohio River every day. And they said it was awfully cold in the winter and they wanted their dad to build them a bridge so that they, it was much easier to get to school. So that's a little legend about that. Um, Henry Bruce's house, um, there's actually two of them. The one that you see a sign on um, was not the house that, um, it, what are the, um, I'm sorry, what are those called? The plaques that tell about the residents, those like metal plaques. Well, what, there's a house that has that on it. And that was a house that um, Colonel Bruce actually built later on. Um, the one where he lived in that Mary Bruce actually often talks about when um, Roebling was staying with him was on Sanford Street. And you probably, if you know anything about the area, you know it as the rugby house. Um, but that was, um, that was his resident and I have a photo of it there and a drawing. Um, so you can, now there's like a parking lot right in front of it. Uh, when it was built, that was all. Um, all yard. Um, and I have a map of the streets of Covington. You can see green up, um, which is right um, parallel to Sanford Street. So if you want to find it, the house is still there. But there, at least the last time I heard, there was not a plaque there, but there was talk that there should be one distinguishing the two houses. All right. Going here. The, uh, the next slide here is um, Mary Bruce when she was young with her doll. She always had special dolls from Paris. Um, and she, you often see those dolls in her paintings. Um, and I believe the doll's name was Mary Claire. And um, here's another picture of her Aunt Sally's Red House. And what's interesting is, you know, the perspective's off, it doesn't matter. What is important is the story that it's telling. The kids would be out in the yard, they'd swing on tree swings, they play together, um, the grandparents were there, the family sitting around talking, um, they play, played croquet. So those details of, of what life was like is what's important. Can I just interject? Sure. Can, and if you see any of the, the paintings with the elder gentleman with the white hair and the white beard, he looks like Colonel Sanders. Um, that is, we don't know how she got her grandpa to look like that, but, uh, but any, any of those that look like Colonel Sandal do, Sanders represents her, her grandfather. Yes. All right. Here we have one called My Doll and I at Grandma's. Um, so she was always doing things with her dolls. Um, she has written a book about her paintings and in that book she states, here I am at Grandma Green's. My doll is with me. Her name is Mary Catherine. She was French with a kid body and a bisque head. We always wore matching outfits. They were made for us by Madame Leone, Mama's French dressmaker in New York. I always thought Madame Leone and Mary Catherine had a special affinity because they both came from Paris. When Mary Catherine traveled with me, she had a little trunk for her clothes that was just like mine. I made tickets for her when we went on the train and the conductor punched them just like a grown-ups. So you can see that she's definitely given this um, moment in history in her pieces. And again, we can see a lot of the, the core of the time. Mm -hmm. Here we go. This one has a, a photograph of 
Mary, um, and then a painting that she did. And she says, I remember this outfit that I am wearing very well. The dress was embroidered and mama had had it made for me in New York. My bonnet came from Paris. My spring heeled shoes were new and so was my parasol. I still had the little blue heart I was wearing. The Roman sash completed my costume, which even then at four or five or whatever I was, I thought was very chic. So she was very much into loving fashion. And then we see that captured in her painting. And then the My Maypole Party. Uh, I don't know if Lori wants to talk a little bit about the Maypole. <laughs> That was a, uh, a German tradition. And, and uh, when we were talking about this painting in particular, we also shared, you know, from my childhood, we ended up in my elementary school, we had a May Day party. And so we um, had the, we did the maple dance, we did the ribbons, we had, it was more like a festival. So each grade level did particular activities and it was all held outside on the school grounds. So um, this one's kind of near and dear to my heart because it brings back my childhood memories as well. Sorry. Oops, thought I had one more. Okay. Um, one last thing I want to say about Mary Bruce is that um, she became quite famous. Um, her work is represented in the collections of Dwight D. Eisenhower's family, the Herbert Humphrey family, the Cincinnati Art Museum, and of course here at Beringer Crawford. So um, she made quite a, quite a name for herself um, sharing her memories. And ours, a lot of our collections came from the Hallmark uh, cards. So they, they had collected her work and had turned them into, or were going to turn them into um, greeting cards. And so that's how a lot of ours were able to stay together and come here. Harlan um, Hubbard, and Lori actually knew Harlan, so I'm sure she'll um, give some more tidbits about him. Um, he was um, an artist, uh, a writer, a philosopher. I mean, all, all things um, artistic and creative, pretty much. Um, he lived his life um, on, the, on the fringe, um, as he says in one of his writings that he almost looked like a pioneer. I like to tell the, the students that come here that because um, he ended up, he built a shanty boat. He um, they lived on it for four years. They pull over and rent some land to get some vegetables. Um, once they ended up building their own house, they didn't have electricity or anything like that. Um, I don't know if they have running water, no running water. So they lived pretty much the pioneer's life. And this is a picture a woodcut that he did of, um, of his home, his cabin. In, his cabin. in Payne Hollow. And there he is with his wife, Anna. So he's an artist, explorer, philosopher, naturalist, inventor, builder, and environmentalist. And he's doing one of his paintings here. And he was so much so when he was um, on his shanty boat, he would collect driftwood that floated by, and that's what he would use to frame his works. It's another picture of him painting. So he was actually born in Bellevue, Kentucky in 1900. Um, he spent most of his 88 years making art, mostly paintings, watercolors, and woodcuts. There's more than a thousand works today, so quite prolific. And Baron Crawford is the largest public holder of his works, and we have close to 60 pieces. Here's a woodcut of Brent, Kentucky. And notice that we can see the history here. We've got lots of the boats. We've got the, the railroad up above. I know Lori wants to talk about... Um, What's interesting about this woodcut in particular, um, Brent, number one, does not even exist. It's now part of, it was um, uh, part of Silver Grove. And this is right in the area where the 275 bridge crosses over into Ohio, where the old Coney, or where Coney Island and where Riverbend is. So um, this was the home, this is the area where Harlan and Anna built their shanty boat that they, as Kim said, traveled on the river for um, actually four five years, years four or five years, years and uh, looking for a place where they were going to end up settling. 
And so you'll see uh, shanty boaters at that time were not very popular. This is back in the 40s. And people thought of them as drifters and maybe more, um, you know, like uh, gypsies in a sense. And so this is interesting because he's showing with this woodcut that there were several shanty boaters that were here in Brent. The next one here is a painting he had actually, there was someone who actually had commissioned this, um, wanting to have more about the river scene. The important aspect to this particular painting, and especially from a historical perspective, is he ended up um, recording all these families and where people lived and what was happening in Brent. And this is another example, though, that the sad thing about this painting right now, if you look in the, um, the writing on the top of the, the block on the right, um, you'll see it's starting to fade. So Harlan being the fact that he used found materials for wherever, uh, you know, when creating his pieces, you know, not just the frames, but he could paint on masonite, he would paint on tin, he could paint on canvases, whatever he happened to have. And we don't really know what he used for this ink. So this is a case, um, and the, fun, the interesting thing is some of these families still live in this area and they come in and they say, we wanna see the painting with our house on it. And so we'll get it out and we'll show it to them. We don't keep this one on display a lot because of the fading of the ink. So for conservation purposes. And then we do have um, all the writing so we can go back and actually have it conserved um, when we can uh, get funding to make that happen. So that, but that's a really important piece. And again, you see the trains and that train on the other side. So the river's on the left, the other side of the train today would be Route 8, Mary Ingalls Highway. Here's a picture of his shanty boat. Um, so you can see uh, size wise with him standing there, it's not that huge. They had a piano inside, they had a table, but everything was pretty much much um, almost like a, an RV today where everything was like in its place and it had a purpose and um, can you see this? so no they can't see it right I now. See it. Okay. Um, he had a little Johnny boat that he um, also made that he would take with them and he and his dog would go out fishing on it so just living the life of someone on the Ohio River. He later um, he took this all the way down to New Orleans. And when he got down there, he ended up selling it. And he bought a car, drove out to California, and then drove all the way back into Kentucky um, to Payne's Hollow, where he eventually built his cabin. Here's one of his paintings, uh, one of the large steamboats, tall stacks that he had seen on the river. Pretty much the river became his neighborhood. So again, recording what steamboats, what boats were running on the Ohio River during his time. Oops. Okay. Okay. So art can also tell, I mean, other, other dimensional art can tell stories as well. Um, and in particular can give insight into our community or insight into um, the people who created and made these. So we have these pieces that you're about to see on display here um, in the student art show because Mary Givenshear and the other um, Edith Lynn, who you're gonna see in a little bit, were both um, teachers. And so they were very, it was very important. They were some of the early um, founders, not only the Newcomb College Pottery Department, um, but also the Cincinnati Women's Art Club. Um, you can see there with the other ones there, but then also then which would be the Covington Art Club. So they were founders with that. Covington Art Club was the club that um, uh, met at Baker Hunt which started that whole student and teaching of the art there. So these are um, recently acquired by us. They're actually donated by Reed Shot or put on loan. And uh, just beautiful pieces. The plaque is all ceramics. So um, again, you know, you can just see these are more natural, nature oriented. And then the um, Edith Lens is a little bit more decorative. 
So this is definitely sharing the time period of the Victorian time period where it um, is very much uh, elaborate, um, very much uh, engulfed in decoration. And this is really um, applied gold and silver. Um, so beautiful piece, a little, a little bit more um, embellished than others, but it is a great example, and especially from Edith Lynn. The other pottery porcelains that we hold in our collections, and we have one of the larger uh, public holders again, of, and this is Kenton Hills porcelains. So on the right, you see kind of their, their brochure, their mark on the bottom of the pottery, and then some of the artists that um, were there, especially initially. So Harold Bopp was the founder. He um, had a little disagreement with Rookwood where he had been employed. He was part of the chemist um, that was at Rookwood to be able to help develop the, the glazes. And so when they, it was all about, he thought he was gonna be able to help Rookwood stay in business during World War II, at the beginning of World War II, and came up with some different ideas of what they could do. And the owners didn't agree with him. So he ended up resigning, coming over to Erlanger and on Dixie Highway opened up a pottery there. It became known as the Kenton Hills Porcelains and um, opened in 1940, but it closed, had a very short life because of World War II and the different um, uh, rations and everything that was, that was happening at that time. Now he left in 1942, and I'm sorry, the pottery stayed till 1943. Um, he left in 1942 and went to work for Corning glass. And there's our trivia question for tonight. He designed what became a widely known pattern for Corning. And you can maybe even find it in your kitchens today still. It, um, we're not going to tell you what it is, but our trivia question is, what was the design that Harold Bopp created? These are some of the other um, Kitten Hills porcelains. This is David Seiler, another founder, another early, well, one of the beginning of the Kitten Hills uh, porcelains on a butterfat glaze, dancers. And the next two slides you're gonna see are from William Henschel. And William Henschel not only started here at Kitten Hills Porcelains, he eventually went to the University of Cincinnati and became head of their art department. So these are lamp bases and they're more nature oriented. Then we have Wolfgang Ritchel. So Wolfgang came to us, um, at, he was one of our very first artists in fresh art. And we got to meet him and had a great time learning all about him. And you can see on the bottom left on this square, he is actually designing stained glass windows that came into, that are actually been installed in our new addition here at Behringer Crawford. So he, um, as it says, he was a scientist, a philosopher, and an artist. He combined his science with his art. So he was um, a pharmacist, a, a, a professor of pharmacy at University of Cincinnati, was born in Austria, but came here in the 1960s and then adopted Covington as his home. These are the windows that are here at Behringer Crawford. So you can see them from the outside, especially when they're lit at night, or you can come in and see them in our hallway. And they're about the people of Northern Kentucky, the archeology span of Northern Kentucky, and the transportation of Northern Kentucky. So again, they tell bits and pieces of our history. So the middle one are the prehistoric mammals that fossils have been found at Big Bone Lick. The one on the left come from when the American Indians were here to the pioneers, to the settlers, to the Civil War era. And on the right shows our different variances of what led people here or what kept our commerce intact. So the flat boat, the steamboat, the trains and the airplanes. This is one of our absolute favorites. Um, he adopted the cathedral here in Covington, became his parish. And what was great about this one is that um, he wanted to showcase the wonderful, wonderful talent that the cathedral had for many years with the choir director of Dr. Schaefer. And if you look very closely 
Um, I don't know who's who's watching today, but if Jerry and Tony Zimbrot are in the audience, if you look, Jerry's sister is right there, Leanne Kornbrock. And so um, there you go. That is Leanne right there. So he not only is capturing the interior of the cathedral, but he's he's also giving us a hint of the people who were there at that time. And he did this in 2003. I want to mention that, that you can see the Frank Duvenac mural that's in the cathedral. Um, he does a reproduction of that of sorts right here as you would actually see it. So, um, so he's also giving a little bit of that history um, from Frank Duvenac. That's a pretty hard thing to do, I think. <laughs> so um, these, are state, these are part of his artist statements with each of these paintings. This is Vanishing Gold. It's all about tobacco. Um, being as Kentucky was kind of his adopted state, and besides Covington being a city, he would travel around the state and look at the different farms. And there's the next several um, paintings coming up are about those, those aspects of Kentucky agriculture. And I think that it was interesting that his statement is as this, that the consequence uh, of devastating ill health effects resulting from tobacco, that it is now dwindling. Whoa. Hang on, Sorry. her fingers move too fast. <laughs> Here's again, the Northern Kentucky farming. <laughs> and so he's recording the agriculture in Kentucky. So he notes that um, besides this is part of his, again, artist statement, but he notes that Kentucky farms are different than farms in other states. And especially if you wanna compare them to the Midwestern states. So we still have our hills. We have a balance of crops. We, um, you know, we might have rivers and streams or ponds running through them. And he's recording again, showing tobacco, but he's also showing the hay and showing some of the other crops. And he notes that corn and soybeans, you know, have been have been um, being grown. And this one's probably my favorite. And you probably think I'm absolutely crazy. But um, one, I love cows. And um, I live in California, Kentucky, in a rural area. So there's cows on my road. And we get to talk to them all the time. But um, they, um, what he noted, again, in his travels of the farms, is that there's various breeds that are around. And each farmer might have different, you know, whether it's going to be um, and John Bow, I know you're on there and you all raised cows, so you're gonna get me on this, but there's dairy <laughs> cows and there's beef cows and, and whatever else. But he also notes, you might see that there's one that looks like a bison or a buffalo because there are farms that in here on the state that we have those. But what's interesting is he did this all in blue because he said he wanted the blue color to be a metaphor of the bluegrass state and that the white uh, stripes and the white frame around it represents the, the fences, the white fences that surround the pastures. And you might not know that if you would look at that painting, you probably would just see blue cows. But once you get the artist statement and their recording and their documentation of what they've done, it all makes sense. And I think that, you know, it does go back to this whole history is nothing but documenting and recording you know, information and that artists definitely are a part of that. And if they represent it visually and they also put it in writing, it's just a gold mine to be able to give us history of our region. Art from the Heart was Wolfgang passed away about 10 or 11 years ago. And um, he was a big support, he participated in Fresh Art every year and was a huge supporter of Baron to Crawford and our programming. He would bring his kids, his grandkids, they would all, whenever they came into town, um, loved the educational programs that we did. And so he, um, we founded this uh, portion of our Fresh Art. Fresh Art, for those who don't know, is when artists come into the park and they create a piece of work and it is freshly auctioned. So you are buying a piece that is done in a matter of days, uh, sometimes one day, sometimes a few days. And, um, but this one, Art from the Heart, he wanted to be able to still contribute and support our youth programming. 
And so we, uh, he's, he donated 100 paintings, 50 of which can be used for the art from the heart uh, section of our Fresh Art event. This one is very interesting because it is the um, Notre Dame Cathedral. Now he did this in 1991 and he, when he was traveling to Paris to present a lecture at an international science conference. And he took his brand new wife, Ingrid, with him and they extended their stay to be able to paint and have a, have a bit of a vacation honeymoon in Paris. And so this um, image actually shows the side of the Notre Dame with the, um, the spire, which as you probably remember in 2019 in April, there was a fire that destroyed that. So this is, this is very, very interesting. Number one, that it's taken from the side view. Number two, that it's recording this cathedral before the devastating fire. And number three, what ended up happening after a year of fighting, fierce battles, that the government, the president and the government finally declared that this symbol of hope and cultural renewal be rebuilt without further delay, exactly as it was before the fire. So there were people who wanted to add more modern touches to it. And that was what the battle was for almost a year before they came to the, I think, good senses of putting it back to the way it was. And this one is this year's Art from the Heart piece for our Fresh Art event. And there's our 28th annual. We've been doing it for 28 years. Looks are gonna be looking a little bit different this year due to the virus. It's all gonna be online. Um, and you are, you can go online and start bidding right now. We have silent art, which is artwork that has been painted or created um, within the past two years. And then we have fresh art, which is what has been painted fresh recently. And then this room that we're standing in is also the student uh, invitational. The work is not for sale, but it's again to be able to um, let everybody know the importance of supporting our youth and our community and even art students, not even art students, but especially <laughs> art students. So we like to support all of our, all the youth with all of our programs in history and geology and, and natural history, and but also art and art history. So, and we'll show you those pictures in just a minute. Yeah. We'll go to the last slide. Whoops, wrong way. There we go. Okay. So visit us. You can find more information about Fresh Art on our website, bcmuseum.org, and email us questions, or we're happy to answer questions that are in the chat now. Farah, do I hit stop share? Yeah, that would be fine. Thank you all so much. Um, we actually have quite a few questions um, from the presentation. So why don't we start with those, Lori and Kim, if that's okay. And then we'll get a little bit more into fresh art. I think we have time for both. Okay. Um, but there were some, um, there were a number of questions. So if you all see me looking down during the presentation, I actually take a lot of notes. So I've got my little book here from all of our episodes. Um, so a number of questions about about Harlan Hubbard, but I want to start with this one. You know, he was a very unique individual, it sounds like. Um, but you know, you started with Mary Bruce Sharon, and then you went to Harlan Hubbard, and they're just such different lifestyles, right? Almost different worlds. Yes. And I was just curious, you know, in terms of, of them and their different lifestyles, how might each of them been like their contemporaries of people of, of their time? You know, did you, do you feel like each of them was very unique? I mean, one kind of separated in one way from a very wealthy family, one from, you know, very earthy, but just curious how you feel like people in Northern Kentucky might've related to them. I think uh, Mary Bruce Sharon definitely would have been um, of the very wealthy class. Um, she's not going to be the normal person who's laboring, um, living in apartments. Um, she had a very unique lifestyle. They had lots of money, lots of, um, she had everything she wanted, very spoiled life, lifestyle. Whereas Harlan, he lived on this. Harlan, but Harlan chose that. You know, he was born in Bellevue, raised in Fort Thomas. 
His father died at an early age and his mother <clears throat> took him to New York. So he did study art for a while in New York. Um, but he came back and he, he was more where he wanted to separate from society. And so, you know, doing, you know, my, he knew my grandfather. And, um, and so um, I think they became friends because my grandfather worked at Grimm's Lumberyard, which was in Brent, where Harlan was building the shanty boat. And so um, I think that, you know, Harlan really, I think, looked at, he really didn't want to be around people. He didn't want to, he didn't want to be involved in the commerce. He bartered for everything that he did, you know, and um, the frames, I mean, he would pick up driftwood off the river. He would ride his bicycle from Fort Thomas. Um, if you know Fort Thomas, you go past South Fort Thomas Avenue, past the fort, you'd go down River Road, you turn right at the stop sign at River Road, and you're basically there in Brent. And he would ride his bicycle down there, and as he would find things, he'd pick them up. So his basket on his bicycle would be filled with found objects. And so he, I think, he connected to the land. He, he wanted to know that he could do what he wanted to do and not be, um, I guess, uh, dependent on anybody else. And so um, Kim calls him the pioneer for the kids, but I put him in that stage where he's either a late time pioneer or he's definitely an early hippie. So where, <laughs> you know, they kind of isolated themselves and wanted to do that, but they weren't, they weren't uneducated. You know, they read to each other every night. Anna was a librarian at Cincinnati Public Library. That's how they met. And so when they went to Payne Hollow, you know, if you if go to their cabin, they had oriental rugs, they had their baby grand piano, they played music every night, they read to each other every night. It was across the river from Madison, Indiana. So they would row the boat over to Madison and go to the library and also go to Hanover. So Hanover College also has some of his paintings in their collection as well. Um, it's very interesting. And if you, if you wanted to visit Harlan, you either had to go a mile, mile and a half down a path, up and down hills on a path. Believe me, it was kind of steep. We did it. And, or you could go to Madison, Indiana, go down to the riverfront, ring the bell, and Harlan would know you're there, and he would row over in his John boat to get you. So that's, that's scary in itself, is rowing, you know, going on a John boat across the Ohio River. But that's what they did. Wow. So that leads me to Andrew Young's question, which is, oh, very cool. This is, this is actually the shanty boat that Harlan built. And um, this is his model of it. So we have another larger model of the shanty boat that someone else built um, that brought it here for our educational purposes. But this is actually from Harlan. And it's interesting because Harlan was very, is very well known for his wood cuts. And I don't know if it's going to show up in there, but the board that the boat is attached to has definitely been carved. And I, I'm, I'm dying to lift up that shanty boat to see if there's really a scene or if it's just there to, <laughs> to be the, represent the river. I won't do that. We I can see that. the cuts in the screen. That's, that's really neat. Your curator would kill me if I, if I would take that apart. <laughs> So Andrew was asking, how did Harlan get along with other shanty boaters on the river? Yes, they were. They're they're definitely a um, a clan, you know, yeah. kind of a group, a group of like-minded individuals. So and they understood each other, and so yes, they did. Very cool. And then, would you say Harlan's work is it associated with a particular style or trend? There's, uh, we, you know, there's been so many different people checking in to even say, where does his work fall into the American art? Um, he definitely, he went through so many different styles. So if you, if we would do a retrospect of his work and show you from each year to year or multiple years, you know, apart, um, you're going to find abstract, you're going to find impressionism, um, you're going to find a little bit of realism. But probably Impressionism is, is, is his most favorite, I guess, I think is what it probably came to. That's great. Or Expressionism, yeah. Well, that, that really sums up, everybody wanted to know about Harlan. Um, uh, some other really interesting comments in the chat about 
um, that Henschel was the Rookwood artist that designed the tile work in Union Terminal T Room, the Crew Tower Arcade, and the Dixie Terminal entrance. So thanks for Blanche for mentioning that. William Henschel was quite talented, and he, you know, just didn't do pottery. I mean, he did, he did, and he was into the airbrush movement kind of back in the probably 70s, um, 60s and 70s. And um, when I first heard of William Henschel, I was working in an art gallery in Lexington and there were pieces that came in and I thought, boy, these are gorgeous. And I had no idea who he was and just knew that the work was beautiful. Came here to work at Beringer Crawford and found out that William Henschel was a potter as well. So um, it's really, it's, it's great, you know, how, you know, you can't, you can't, you know, nail an artist into, you can't always nail an artist into one medium. You know, they, they explore in many different ways. Right. It's so, it's so neat to be able to see that level at the museum as well, where you have the space, you know, the ability to showcase mm -hmm. um, their different talents. We have some other paintings that we can show. Great. I'm just going to do that. Well, um, here is one of, let's see, here is one of Harlan's. <laughs> Railroad Bridge Crossing in Newport. And you can see the, um, I'm trying to see if I've got it in the right spot. Um, lots of expressive brush strokes on this. And you can even see the driftwood for his frame. But again, you're getting the, um, what would be around in the times. Because mm -hmm. art is not created in a vacuum by any means. Here is a ritual showing the riverboats. The might think it was during the 1990, 1997 flood. So he's captured um, what it, Covington during that flood. Let's see if you can see it a little bit. And then here is the Mary Bruce Sharon. We hit it on a slide, but this is the one with her, with her um, Mary Catherine in, in bed with her. So you can see she would she had a look at this. I mean, it's a huge room. So she obviously had a very um, wealthy upbringing. And this is during a time where a three bedroom house would be rented for about $10. A four bedroom house would rent for $15 and that's for a month. So to have a room like that, they had quite a bit of money. I do want to show you a few of the drawings of the, of the students in this room. Should I say what, what they are? Um, this one here was our first place winner. If I can hold that right. It's by Iris Sullivan. She's an 11th grader. Um, so she actually created this um, last year or over the summer. So she could have been a sophomore when she created it. And she goes to Holy Cross High School. This here is our second place or our runner, first runners up. And this one is also by an 11th grader. It, um, he goes to Covington Catholic High School, Aaron Muffle. And then um, show you some of the other ones here. What talent we have in Northern Kentucky. Yes, definitely. This one here is our second runners up or third place. Um, this is by Jenna Shriver. She's a 12th grader at Notre Dame Academy. Give you a look at all of them. These are spectacular, Kim. They are, they are absolutely wonderful. It was very, very hard to come up with our winners. Let's see if I can show you this one back here. And the interesting thing is um, this was all, this one here. You know, being able to do this is through the Connie O'Donnell Memorial Fund. And so the winner, um, the student gets money and the classroom receives $500 so that the classroom can decide um, what to do with that $500. So if they can add something into their, into their room, in the art room, or they can have a party, they can do whatever. But the winner's um, classroom gets $500. And some of our silent art pieces in particular, the sale of those um, during this year 100% of the sale will go back into the O'Donnell Fund, the Connie O'Donnell Memorial Fund. So it's all well, good. 
Do you want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how Fresh Start came to be? And then I, I know I have looked on the bidding site. Um, I've let my husband know that there are some items on my wish list. <laughs> And maybe talk a little bit about, I mean, I don't know if we have time to talk about every single artist, so I don't want anyone to feel left out, but maybe talk a little bit about some of the styles that you end up seeing uh, during Fresh Art that might be a way to, to handle it. Yeah, we, oh my goodness. So <laughs> there's there's something for everyone, believe me. So there are, there are, you know, wonderful landscapes. There's impressionistic landscapes. There's more realistic landscapes. There's abstract, there's watercolors. I mean, there can be, it can be watercolor oils, acrylics, pastels, pottery. pottery. Um, we have jewelry, so it can be any, you know, about anything. And the tambour beaded mask. Yes, a, a mask, you know, you, uh, you definitely want to have, you know, that <laughs> you're going out to party mask. So um, it, is, it is beaded, and so that was our oh, artist our, that was here. Signed painting by the for um, the Reds. Yes, the yes. Players. So um, Cowboy, the Reds player, um, who I guess he was a pitcher for the Reds well way back. And now he does the uh, announce announcers. And he's one of the announcers for the Reds. And one of our local artists does a lot with Cincinnati Reds, with the Hall of Fame Museum, um, and with other, hall, uh, I think, sports Hall of Fames too. So we do have that portrait of Cowboy. Yes. Um, and yes. Oh, great. Yeah. So that's all. I mean, it's, it's really, really wonderful. We started this as a way, um, you know, to really involve artists, you know, so we were still kind of young in our art collection at the museum. Um, and we wanted to be able to showcase, you know, the talent that exists in our community. Um, and the fact that, you know, just because perhaps they're not quite in a museum yet um, does not mean that they're not worthy to support and purchase and have in your house. And so um, we teamed up with some gallery owners at the time and said, can you help us find artists who would be willing to um, share part of the proceeds? I guess willing to take the challenge, number one, to be, because at that time we were giving them gosh, maybe six hours to complete a, a work. And so um, we needed to find those that were willing to take that challenge. And then we needed to find people who wanted to support the arts and support, of course, the youth because the money, the proceeds from this event support our educational programs, um, which in turn obviously benefit the youth. And so um, it's been, it's been fun every year. You, you don't know what you're going to find each year. You think it's the same program, but it's really not because the art changes, the crowd changes, the bidding wars change. You know, it, it becomes a very, very fun event. And unfortunately, again, it's, we can't do it live in person, but you can still use your chat buttons and use your hands and still be able to fight with your neighbors um, as to, and your friends to say, I'm going to purchase that piece. And the best thing is knowing that it does support the artists and it does support the museum and our youth programs. That is wonderful, Lori. Um, I am actually putting here um, the website link in the chat. So if anyone would like to see what is in store for them and what they can actually go ahead and bid on right now, um, I've put that here in the chat. So it's freshart2020.givesmart.com. So, um, and like I said, once you start looking, um, give yourself a few minutes or maybe longer because it's going to be clear very soon how absolutely amazing some of, some of this is. And I, the other thing I noticed when I've attended in years past is the size difference. So everybody might want to, if you think about the perfect spot for this item, you might want to look at the dimensions or, um, and now can people come to the museum if they want to see? Absolutely. All the artwork is on display right now. Um, it's hard to buy art by viewing an image on a screen. 
So come and actually look at it, you know, and then you can definitely um, picture that size, you know, and, and colors and, you know, so we do our very best to get the most professional images up on the screen so you can see the accuracy of colors and, and so forth. But we all know different computers have different color screens. And so it, you can't always get the exact, but you'll get the great idea behind it. So and yeah. We did, um, if you click on the piece that you find that you like, we did put other pictures on it. I have some close-ups so that you can see the texture of it. Um, I did take shots where you can see several of them on the wall, so you can kind of get an idea of, of size there if you're not able to come in. That's wonderful, Kim. I'm glad. I, I didn't have a chance to dig that deeply, so I'm glad to hear that that's available. I just know we have some artists that, you know, they, they might have a very detailed piece and it's small. We have some artists that tend to have a, a larger canvas and, um, it really, there's things for office, for home, for, for anything. So, um, well, you know, we have a few minutes left and I know one of the things, trivia question? yes, let's do the trivia question. So we had a couple of answers, but why don't you go ahead and tell us the answer and then we can announce our winner. Okay, so Harold Bob, who went to corn in glass was the designer of the corn, the blue corn flower pattern design that you'll see a lot on the Pyrex dishes. Wonderful. Well, we have um, two winners this evening. So um, they answered within just a minute of each other. And um, we do have quite a few, um, let me see if you can see, buttons. So um, Debbie Blake, congrats. And Lana Rutterer, congrats. So um, we should have your addresses. Um, in our uh, database, but uh, if not, we'll be in touch via email to make sure that we can mail those to you all. So, and of course the bragging rights that come with winning our quiz, you know, <laughs> it's a very sought after item. So um, <laughs> thank you all so very much. Um, I know that I cannot wait to get back to the museum soon. Do you all want to talk, you've got a couple minutes left about other other things that are happening at, you know, physically at the museum or online right now that maybe people should be looking for? We um, definitely go online. We have a lot of virtual programs. Um, History Hour, of course, is wonderful, but there's educational programs. Teachers can call or talk to Kim. Kim has been reaching out. Um, we can do virtual programs within the classrooms. Jason has um, beefed up his... Uh, curator chats and has been taking them on the road so, um, you know was, you never know where he's going to show up um, <laughs> yeah he was to be with us tonight but he came in late from um down in in eastern kentucky where he was videoing a photographer that we were to have on display for a photo focus and so since photo focus closed down we um, decided to, and we were granted funds from them to be able to showcase um, the, the photographs. And so in, in its place, it took us a while to be able to make this all happen, but he and our social media uh, person, Mary Jane Cauldron, spent the past three days in Appalachia filming and videoing. So that will end up being shown on our website um, and probably with photo focus as well. And so just stay tuned for that. Um, and then after Fresh Art, we will be going into our holiday season, but we're not sure what that's going to look like this year. So we're still planning and designing. Um, it's probably not going to be the same as it has been, but it'll still be fun and worthy to come up and visit and bring your kids and grandkids. Absolutely. So the moral of the story is everyone needs to uh, look at bcmuseum.org on a regular basis and find out what's new and make sure they're following us on Facebook. Yes. And, um, you know, definitely we masks. Kim wants to say something about masks. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, we, we ask everybody to wear a mask. We oh, yes. We have lots of um, sanitation stations where you can get hand sanitizer so that people can distance and you can still feel safe when you're coming. Perfect. And we do want to re also remind, we do close that we open from 10 to 3.30, Tuesday through Saturday, and then Sundays are 1 to 3.30. But that gives us time in the afternoon to deep clean every day. And I commend our staff for being able to make sure that happens. So 
Um, I, would, I would easily eat off the table here at the museum because of how well things are cleaned. Wonderful. Well, we will see everyone again next week for In the Days of the Grand Water Power, the Rise and Fall of Grist Mills in Northern Kentucky with Janine Kreinbrink. Uh, we are happy to have her back again. And hopefully we will be seeing everyone on October 4th for Fresh Art virtually. So um, everyone, until then, have a great night. Thank you so much, Lori and Kim. This was awesome. I loved it. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.